and stand with us, please. And worship the Lord together, all right?
we're here today primarily to worship him. We studied, talked about in Sunday school class this morning. Um, where does worship come from? The heart. You know, it's expressed in outward means, perhaps, but it comes from the heart. And we just thank God that He's given us a heart of worship today. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. A couple of announcements here. Um, one is uh, men. Next Saturday is our monthly men's breakfast. It's going to be at 9 o'clock right here in the fellowship hall. So I hope to see every one of you here. Uh, Brother Bob uh, Philippi is going to be leading that for us. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to participate in one of those yet, now's the time to start. Okay? God bless you. And uh, also I'd like to have uh, Katie come up now. She's going to talk to us a little bit about missions and about our pastoral search. Is this on? Oh, yeah, is it on? Okay. So I didn't know if any of you knew, but I um, started doing M NMI last year, and then Pastor asked me to be the church board secretary as well. So I'm serving both roles right now. Um, so I'm going to start off with... Uh, the alabaster offering and I have to say kudos to you guys because we what's been counted so far is four hundred and fifty dollars which is great it's absolutely great that makes my heart so happy you've been so generous and that's not even all of it yet because apparently there's this whole thing of counting coins <laughs> that I was unaware of that anyway so that that will actually be the minimum it's probably going to go up from there so thank you so much thank you so much for your alabaster gifts that's very generous um i think in board meeting if i'm not mistaken jeff you said a three to four hundred is an average so the fact that we're at 450 right now and that'll likely go up a little bit makes my heart so happy so thank you for your generosity and and everything with that so um, the second thing is, um, you know, our, our need for our permanent pastor. And I just wanted to tell you where we are with all of that. So our church board has met with um, our district superintendent, P Pastor Lutz, Dave Lutz. And um, so there's very good news on that front as well. Um, so first of all, we do have an interim pastor that will be joining our church until we can find a permanent replacement. So um, Jeff is preaching today, um, and he will actually be here next week and preach for two Sundays. And because he already had something on his schedule the last Sunday of March, he would not, was not able to join us. So my husband Rob is actually going to step up and preach, which is like, yay, you know. <laughs> for those of you, you know, that knew me all these years, I came by myself. So it, to me, it's like a great, it's a great witness. It's a great praise. Um, so this is the cool thing. I like this guy already. <laughs> <laughs> his name is T um, Pastor Terry. Pastor Terry Passmore is his name, and I like him already. Somebody asked me why I like him already. Why? Thank you, because he's a Terry. I gotta like him, right? <laughs> so I'm already on board with him, and I'm so excited. I've only had um, a conversation with him and asked him, you know, if there's anything I can do to make your transition here more comfortable and so forth. So everything is good. With that, we do have a permanent person that will be here as an, uh, we have a interim person that will be here permanently. Okay. The second thing is that, I'm, and I'm really appreciative of this, Pastor Lutz is leading us. We are being prayerful and we are being intentional. And already the board members have started to, um, we actually did like a survey amongst the board members to kind of look at, you know, we know who we are as a church and what does our church need? And there was, a, you know, a good survey, and, you know, um, that's a great way to start and kind of get some ideas about, you know, what our church needs. And we do want to move forward. I believe that we're doing good work here in our little corner of uh, Jackson Township, and we want to continue to do so. So that's a very positive thing, and it actually has been posted, is my understanding. So he may be receiving some, you know, some applicants now even. So... Um, but we do need as a church to pray for whoever will lead us in our next, you know, in our next months and years ahead, hopefully. Um, so the position is posted, and I will periodically come up and just let you know when I know more. I will definitely let you know 
Um, but I really like that he's taken the time for us to step back and, and to be scientific about it, in, in other words. <laughs> you know. Um, so I'm very happy about that. And Pastor Lutz is a great district superintendent, and he's been around a long time. So I do have complete faith and confidence that we'll have the right person here. We'll have the right person here. So, um, you know, and as Jeff has mentioned before, this didn't take God by surprise. And so, uh, so at any rate, I'm very happy about all of that. And you guys have done a great job with Alabaster. Thank you so much. And that's it. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, yes, uh, we may not know who our next pastor is going to be, but uh, we know someone who does know. So uh, let's uh, right. just uh, rely on God to uh, lead us in the right direction there. Would you stand, please, and join me in the reading of our uh, church mission statement? It's to be transformed by Jesus and to lead our community to him. Amen. 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 Take a few moments now to greet one another today, please. <laughs>
trust him that was really really weak I'm preaching this morning so you got to talk to me okay I said isn't that wonderful that our God is still God in the midst of darkness huh I'm thankful I'm thankful you may be seated the year was uh, 1992 December 8th 1992, my dad, who is now with Jesus, came up and handed me a newspaper article, and he said, son, he always called me son because I was the brightest one in my family, <laughs> he said, son, he said, someday you're going to need this article. I've kept that in my Bible. Not just this Bible, but many other Bibles. Every time I've gone through a Bible and had to change. And I've kept that with me. And it says simply this. How many of you remember Dear Abby? Oh, you guys are old. I'm getting them on reruns here. Okay. <laughs> a perfect minister is hard to find. From Dear Abby. I love this. One of the toughest tasks a church faces is to choose a good minister. A member of the official church board was undergoing this painful process. Finally, he lost his patience. He'd watched pastoral candidates come and go, and applicants one after another being dismissed for one reason or another. Finally, he got to the point of, he said, gentlemen, I have an applicant I want you to hear about. The letter read, gentlemen, understanding your pulpit is vacant, I should like to apply for the position. I have many qualifications. I've been a preacher with much success and also have had some success as a writer. Some say I'm a good organizer and I've been a leader in most places that I've gone. I'm over 50 years old. I have never preached in one place more than three years. In some places, I have left town after my work has caused riots and disturbances. I must admit, 
I've been in jail three or four times. But not because of any wrongdoing. My health is not too good, though I still get a great deal done. The churches I have preached in have been small, even though they've been in large cities. I've not gotten along well with church leaders in those towns where I've preached. In fact, some have physically threatened me and others have physically beaten me. I'm not too good of, at keeping records. I've been known to even forget who I baptized. However, if you can use me, I sure would like the opportunity. The board member looked over at his constituents and said, well, what do you think? Shall we give him a call? The good church folks were aghast. Call an unhealthy, troublemaking, absent-minded ex-jailbird who, the church board said, who in the world would be crazy enough to apply for our church? The board member looked at him and said, well, it's signed the Apostle Paul. I want us to know today that your idea of a perfect minister and a perfect pastor is going to be different than my idea of a perfect pastor. Right? Your idea is going to be completely... Uh oh, I'm caught. Your idea is going to be one that doesn't get messed up in the cords. Your idea is going to be different than mine. It's going to be different than Mark's. It's going to be different than any of these guys. Your idea is going to be different. I don't want... I will make a, a, a public declaration right now. I don't want who I choose. I want who God chooses. Amen? Don't you? Now, I have complete confidence in Pastor Lutz. He told us in the, in the, the board meeting that he is going to do all the vetting. You know what that means? He's going to dig into everybody's past. He's going to figure out their credentials, their, their education, their experience. He's going to do all that stuff for us. Isn't that wonderful? All I know is that I believe that God has exactly the right person, as Katie said. And that's what we're going to pray about this morning. We have many, many requests. We have many, many in this congregation that need a touch. Dale's granddaughter, where's Dale at? Dale. Dale's granddaughter has a tumor that came on her brain. She needs a miracle, but the God I serve is the way maker in the midst of the darkness. There's other he others here and some that are online this morning that need a, a miraculous touch from God, but I am convinced that God has not given up on this church. I am convinced that God's presence is in this church. Thank you, Akimi. You're the only one that got real excited about that. And God is here today. And I believe, I believe, I believe with all my heart that he's going to touch our hearts. He's going to touch our lives. He's going to touch this church. He knows exactly who our next pastor is going to be. But in the interim period, he knew who was going to be here. He knew who was going to be preaching and going to be ministering. And I encourage you to come and be a part of the fellowship of the church. Because God is here in this place. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Lord, that, that you're not looking for the perfect minister. You're looking for the right minister. And we're leaving that in your hands, Lord. We've tried to figure it out. We don't understand the whys or the how comes. But Lord, we trust you today. We have staked our eternal being on the fact that, God, we can trust you. So we trust you today. We stake this church on the fact that we can trust you, Lord, that you will bring in the right person to be pastor and to lead this congregation. But Lord, in the meantime, we rejoice in the fact 
that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just like last week when Pastor Bruce was here, God, you were here then. Lord, you're here today. And we thank you for that. We pray over these needs, these, these ones that don't know you as Lord and Savior on this, this uh, altar area today. We ask that, God, you will save their souls and draw them to you. We pray over those today that need a miraculous healing. For Dale's granddaughter, we ask that, God, you will touch in a mighty way the other requests that are here today. Lord, we just know that, God, you have this under control. Lord, I pray that faith will rise within us. I pray that faith will rise within us. Those that may be discouraged today, those that are having a hard time today, I pray that faith will rise within us and understand that, God, we serve a living God who is not dead, but he is alive and he's in this place. And you have all this under control. We pray for this nation, Lord, and this world that is in chaos right now. But we thank you, Lord, so much that the word says that where there are wars and rumors of war, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. Lord, we look up and we rejoice in knowing that soon and very soon the, the clouds are going to part and we're going to be taken away with you, Lord. Come soon, Lord Jesus, we pray. Father, we ask you today over the offering that, God, you will bless it in a mighty way. We pray that it will be multiplied beyond our wildest dreams and our wildest expectations. And we thank you so much for it. And we bless those that can give today, that can give and do give sacrificially, Lord. We pray your blessing upon them. And Lord, those that may not be able to give because of financial issues with their work or whatever, we pray you'll bless them with new jobs and greater incomes. We honor you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.
you're so awesome. Aren't you so blessed to have our praise team? I am so blessed to have our praise team. Praise God. Thank you. In just a few moments, we're going to be receiving communion this morning. And uh, before we uh, go any further, I want to thank Mark so much because I, I put him to work this week. And uh, I have a lot of scripture and it's going to be up on the screen. I, I was laughing. I thought if I use a lot of scripture, nobody can say anything bad. Because if you, if you got anything bad to say, tell it to Jesus, you know what I'm saying? And uh, this morning, I am, I am so thankful. Our, you know, I, it, it breaks my heart because a lot of us, our hearts have been heavy. How many of you, let's be honest, how many of you have had a heavy heart? I've had a heavy heart. I, I'm, I got both hands raised. I've had a heavy heart. Well, I, I'm at the point, I just snorted. Did you hear that? I just want you to know today that I'm tired of a heavy heart. I'm ready for some, some joy, and I'm ready for some thankfulness to come in. I'm ready to remember the body of Christ today. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for a change in atmosphere, a change in attitude in my own life, in my own heart, in my own spirit. Yes, Pete? Yeah, Pete stands to that. He agrees with that, and I'm ready for it. So in just a, just a, a very short moment, give me like one or two words you're thankful for today. Come on. Just yell them out. I'm thankful for family. family. Good. The air that we breathe. Amen to that. Nice. My Christian husband. God's love. Yes, we're thankful for every... The, anybody else? Real quick. I don't want to... Church family. Yeah. What? Prayer. Salvation. Yeah, I'm thankful for all those things. I'm thankful for the fact that we can gather together in this house. And uh, so this week, I was thinking about communion, and I'm thinking about the fact that I am probably the least, the least one who is capable of presenting communion to this place. And the reason I know that is because I live with me. Huh? I live with me. And if the truth is known, if you were in my shoes this morning, you would feel the same way because you live with you. And we're not perfect, are we? Man, we have some, I, I like to say, we have issues. <laughs> right? We got issues. We all got issues, you know. Well, I was thinking about God's grace and the grace of God and and, and grace can be many different things. We, we say a, a person dances with grace. This morning, Akimi was dancing before the Lord in here. Man, did you bless us. You did. You were back there. Noah was dancing before the Lord this morning. He had just blessed us. We were, we were in practice, and they were back there just, just dancing before God and having a great time. We, if you ever saw me dance, you would think it's certainly not graceful. We can say, we say grace before meals. Grace has many different means. The Queen of England is filled with grace. Not really, but she thinks she is. Grace can be referred to dignity and elegance, but grace as a Christian, oh, it's so different. Grace is is an amazing thing. Grace can mean, and here's, here's the Christian lingo, and I'll bet, you, I'll bet you if I just threw this out, you would know it. What is grace? Unmerited favor. You ask almost 90% of Christians, and they'll come up, and, and you say, well, what is grace? Oh, it's easy. Unmerited favor. That's such a Christian term. Let's get down to it this morning. Grace is extending special favor to someone who doesn't deserve it who hasn't earned it and who can never repay it that's grace i want to read that again it's the someone who doesn't deserve it who hasn't earned it and who never can repay it one of the things i always try to remember is that god has had grace upon me and I want you to know he's had grace upon you, whether you want to admit it or not. In fact, you better admit it. 
He has had grace upon us. One of the great illustrations of grace in the Old Testament came in the, the life of David, King David. And uh, just to kind of set the story, King Saul, who was king of, of Israel at that time, King Saul hated David because David had the hand and the anointing of God upon him. Isn't it amazing when somebody is truly anointed, they have enemies? And David had enemies. And here's Saul, and you know the story, man. Saul tried to kill him over and over again, tried to kill him so many times. And, and so King Saul had a son. His name was Jonathan. And Jonathan was exactly the opposite of his dad. Jonathan loved David. They were buds. They were, they were like best friends. And that made King Saul even more mad. Sad situation in this story we're going to talk about this morning. King Saul is dead. And Jonathan is dead. They were killed on the same day in battle. Now, David is king. There is peace in the land. How many of you would love to have some peace in the land? Yeah, we can have some peace in the land in many different areas, right? There is peace in the land. King David is sitting back and he is, he is enjoying life. And then he begins to remember that he had promised Saul and he had promised Jonathan something very important. And so we're going to look at some scripture this morning, thanks to, to Mark. And, and this, is a, this is a lot, but, but bear with me here. In 1 Samuel, so David said, look, tomorrow is a new moon feast. Now they're getting ready to have a big feast. And the king has invited David to come. King Saul has invited David to come. Remember, this is years before the story here. He said, look, tomorrow is a new moon feast, and I am supposed to dine with the king, but let me go and hide in the field until evening of the day after tomorrow. And if your father misses me at all, in other words, David's saying, if, if I'm not at the table and your dad asks me, let's just do this, and your dad asks where I'm at, tell him, David... Uh, earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for the whole clan. And if he says, very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure that he is determined to harm me. In other words, if Saul says, oh, that's okay, I'm glad he went, then I know I'm safe. But if Saul says, where in the world is he at? He knows he was supposed to be here then <laughs> I'm in big trouble. Then Jonathan said to David, I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, that I will surely sound out my father by this time of day after tomorrow. And if he is favorably disposed towards you, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father intends to harm you, may the Lord deal with Jonathan, be it ever so severely, if you do not let me know and send you away in peace, may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. Jonathan is saying, I promise you that I will tell you the truth, David. There's no question I'm going to tell you the truth. If my dad is out to kill you, Jonathan at this point doesn't believe it. But he said, if my dad is out to kill you, I promise you I will let you know. But show me, now this is Jonathan talking to David, but show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live so that I may not be killed and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family. That's the word. Do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord call David. David's enemies to account and Jonathan and David reaffirmed the oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan made a, he, he asked David for a promise. He said, David, basically this, you're going to be king someday. And when you're king, I'm asking you, 
as a favor to me to never cut my family out, to never get rid of my family. So David is remembering this promise that he made to Jonathan, that Jonathan said, you're going to be on the throne, but will you show my family grace? How many of you would love for your families to be shown grace? I want my families to be shown grace, man. I, I want them to be shown grace. So David agreed. Then David is not only remembering his promise to, to Jonathan, but he's also remembering his promise to King Saul. And he says, this is, this is Saul talking to David now. He said, I know that you will surely be king. Now, Saul is the king right now. But he's telling David, I know you're going to be king. That's quite a statement, huh? I know you're going to be king. I know that you surely will be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. And then Saul returned home. But David and his men went out to the stronghold. Once again, there is peace in the land. Saul is dead. Jonathan is dead. They are David is remembering the promise that he made to King Saul and the promise that he made to Jonathan. And David is wondering, here's another scripture for you. I told you I had a lot. And David asked, this is sometime later, this is years later. David asked, is there anyone still out there left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake. David the king is saying, is there anybody still out there? Is there anybody that I can show kindness, that I can show grace, that I can show favor to? And the servant says, now there was a servant of Saul's household name. Is it Ziba or Ziba? Yeah, you don't know either. I love that. <laughs> When, my, my, my favorite all-time thing is to remind myself that when I get to heaven, I'll find out how to pronounce all those names. It's great. We'll call him Ziba. Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba, and they summoned him to appear before David and the, the king and said to him, are you, David said, are you Ziba? And he said, at your service, he replies. And the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul? To whom I can show God's kindness. And Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Jonathan's son, the grandson of the previous king, is crippled. I love the response of David because he didn't ask, How crippled is he? <laughs> He didn't ask how crippled is he? Is it, can, he can he walk? Can he move? How, how crippled is he? He just, he just simply said, where is he? Where, where is he? I want to show grace to him. I want to show, show favor to him. You got to get this right here. He says, where is he? The king asked. And Ziba answered, he is at a house of Makar, son of Amiel, in the city of Lo Debar. All right. The, the whole time I know I've sounded really like, really not very smart, but right now I'm about to be smart. You ready? <laughs> in Hebrew, I love saying that. In, the, in Hebrew, Lo Debar is broken up into two, two words. Lo means no, and Debar means pasture. Or pasture land. He is the, the grandson of the king is in Lodabar, a place where there is no pasture, no pasture land. The descendant of Saul and Jonathan was at a place of unimaginable desolation. He lives in some obscure, barren land in Palestine. Now, let me just kind of change the, the scene here for just a second. In every transition of 
the kingdom, in other words, every time there was a new king, the new king would come in and kill every member of the previous administration's family. So like the Bushes would kill the Obamas. And the Trumps would kill the Obamas. And the Bidens would kill the Trumps. <laughs> they're, they're trying to do that anyhow, but that's another story. David had the right to kill every one of Saul's family. That's what Mephibosheth understood. He knew that I, 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 I better just stay away. Now, how did he become crippled? This is, this is the big thing. This is years before. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news of Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled, and his name was Mephibosheth. He was perfectly fine. King Saul and Jonathan were killed on the same day at the same battle. The nurse grabbed Mephibosheth because she knew that the new king had a right to kill him, and she must have loved him. She grabbed him. She's running her out. And she falls and stumbles right on top of him. And cripples, probably breaks both of his feet. Now here's Mephibosheth. He is in Lodabar. He is in hiding. He is hiding out from the king because he knows that he is a, a marked man and he just absolutely knows that if the king ever gets word of him, he is going to what? He's going to die. He's going to die for sure. So, <laughs> I, I, I love this. It says, um, what does it say? It says nothing right there. Okay, we got to go back here. I like this little clicker. It gives me power. It's the only kind of power I get sometimes. I like that. So he's in Lodabar. King David says, go get him. Can you imagine he's been in hiding for years? And all of a sudden, <laughs> knock at the door. Can you imagine for all of his life, all of his adult life, he probably was scared about that knock. They opened the door. The king wants to see you. <laughs> that, I, I know you're all more spiritual than me and you got more faith than me, but me, it would have been terrified. What do you, what do you mean the king wants to see me? Aren't you Jonathan's son? Aren't you grandson to King Saul? Yeah, king wants to see you. King wants to see you. Are you Mephibosheth? He goes and has no idea what to expect. Terry, can I use your... Thank you. Can I touch your stuff? I do. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. You'll have to get that from my wife. Men never have money. Wives do. Here comes Mephibosheth, and he's unable to walk. Can't you imagine it? He probably didn't have cushions on his arms either. And there comes Mephibosheth, and he can't walk. And, and the word says, in the translation, in the, the New International, it says, he bowed down before the king. But check this out. The reality, and I really, really looked at this, and I had Mark put two different, uh-oh, I'm losing, my, I'm losing my, my thing here. Mark told me if I put this on right, I wouldn't have any problems. That shows what I know. <laughs> now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, are you Mephibosheth? He says, behold. And the Amplified 
Again, it says he came to David and fell down and laid himself down. Mephibosheth did not just come in and bow down to David. Can't you just see Mephibosheth throwing the crutches and laying down before Mephibosheth or before King David on his face before him because he knew that he was about to die. He's laying down on his face before the king. Spare my life, O oh, great king. I should just keep these up here and then that way. That way Carrie can't move. It's great. <laughs> Are you Mephibosheth? King David. Oh, bless his heart. Man, we could all learn some of this, right? King David said, Don't be afraid, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Grace. Here's Mephibosheth. He's on his face before King David, throws his crutches out, wanting to spare my life, spare his life. And David says, Are you Mephibosheth? Yes, I am. He says, Well, don't you be afraid. Mephibosheth, we say that a bunch of times. Mephibosheth has been saying, I've been afraid all my life. Ever since I was five years old, I've been afraid. I've been in terror. I've been worried to death. Now you're telling me not to be afraid? David shows grace. How many of you like history in this room? You like history? There's a, there's a great his, historical fact that I, I absolutely love. It's about Thomas Jefferson. You can think whatever you want about Thomas Jefferson. We've been to Monticello and... There were parts of Monticello that just blessed me so much, and there were other parts that made me weep and cry. Okay? I'll I'll just be honest with you. But Thomas Jefferson, as he was president, the story goes, true story, that he and his men were riding a horse someplace, and there was a big stream there, and there was a guy sitting there who had walked a long distance, a long journey. And he needed to cross this river Thomas Jefferson's men went on across the river and the poor old guy walked up to the president. Can you imagine that today? The poor old guy walked up to the president and said, can I have a ride across the river? Thomas Jefferson grabbed him and pulled him up on the horse and said, yeah, I'll give you a ride. Took him across the river. After he was over, he was across the river. Thomas Jefferson's men were appalled and they said, why in the world would you ask the president of the United States to give you a ride across the river? The guy said, well, first of all, I didn't know he was the president. He said, but secondly, he said it was an easy choice. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, on your faces was written no, but on his face was written yes. He had a yes face. I want you to know that People who have grace have yes faces. Don't you love to be around people who have a yes face? I want to have a yes face. I'd like to tattoo yes across my face. (laughs) Some of you would probably like to do that too, wouldn't you? To me. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? He had no capabilities whatsoever. He couldn't walk. He couldn't provide for his family. He was living in hiding. He was at a place where he didn't even know where in the world he was going to, how he was going to make a living. He was in Lodabar, the worst place of humanity. The king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson. That's Mephibosheth. Think of that. I've given I the king. I have a right to kill him. I have the right to kill him, and nobody would say a word. But for the sake of Jonathan, I have given him your master's grandson. 
everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of the master, I love this, I love this, let me say it one more time, I love this, will always eat at my table. Wow. Mephibosheth says, I'm just a dog. I'm just a dog. What are, you, what are you being nice to me for? I'm just a dog. And David, if you remember right, he heard that one other time. A guy by the name of Goliath. Goliath said, what, I'm a dog that you send this little kid? Don't you think David was reminded of that at that moment when, when Mephibosheth said, what, am I a dog? And David said, no, you're not a dog. You're not a dog. He was going to eat at the king's table. Can't you imagine all of a sudden the supper bell rings? I don't know if they had, you know, a supper bell or whatever. Ding, 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 ding. The family and friends gather together for the, for the king's table. Here comes Ammon, son of David, clever and witty. And he comes in at first, very stately in his garments. And he comes and he and he sits down at the he sits down at the master's table. He sits down at the king's table and he sits there all prom and perfect. Next in watched Joash. Joash was not a relative of David. Joash was master of the guard. He was a guest, muscular, masculine, bronze skin, walking like a soldier, kind of like me. Yeah, I, yeah, right. Just wanted to see if anybody's awake. There comes Absalom, perfect in every way, talk like, you know, talk with perfect diction, read perfectly. He was the most handsome in the kingdom. Not a blemish, no pimples. It was, it was amazing. Here comes Tamar, the daughter of, of the king. Beautiful in all ways, and she found her seat at the table along with the rest of them. It was wonderful. And then there came Solomon, ready. You know, he'd been studying all day probably. Took time to eat. They're all sitting there, prim and proper, around the table, waiting for the king. And then, here comes Mephibosheth. And can't you imagine those that were at the table wondering, what is he doing here? He's not perfect. He's not perfect. He's, he's crippled. He has nothing to offer. He has nothing any good. And he probably gets to his chair and maybe stumbles into the chair and falls or whatever into the chair and he just sits there all of a sudden the king walks in i'm not sure if you're aware of it or not but when the king would walk into the hall everyone was required to stand if you didn't stand the king had the option of having you killed <laughs> i should try that at my house at thanksgiving great The king, the king had the option to kill you. David comes walking in, and there's Ammon and, and Joash and Absalom and Tamar and Solomon. They stand, but there is, there, is, there is Mephibosheth, and he's just sitting there. He's probably reaching for his crutches, trying to get up, but he can't. Now, here's Grace. Here's grace. Can't you just envision David walking by Mephibosheth and just tapping him on the shoulder? It's all right. You just sit there. I'm glad you're eating at my table. Some here today are spiritually disabled also. 
Some have been in that low debar period where, where you've been in this dry, dry Sahara desert experience. It's like, God, where are you? And then, and then Pastor Bruce leaves, and now it's like, oh, God, you've forsaken me. You're so far away. You haven't sensed the presence of God. You haven't sensed, I want you to know today that the God I serve, the Jesus I serve, has a yes face. You might sit there and you might feel like, well, I am not worthy to partake of communion today because I have been so low and so bad and so, so, so far away. I haven't felt or sensed the presence of God. I haven't read the word in weeks. I haven't, I haven't prayed in a, in a month. I just feel empty inside. I want you to know that Jesus has a yes face. Jesus says his table, just like David's table, it wasn't for only the perfect. It was for those that had grace. He doesn't care where you've been, what you've been doing, how spiritually crippled you are. He says, come and sit at my table today. Come and sit at my table. 